It is the blueprint to my destiny. Today, I stand here in agreement with Psalm 1 and 2 Peter 1 because it is the truth that sanctifies because of the blood of Jesus the Christ. It is the unchangeable, the unshakable, the unstoppable word of grace, the word that redeems and releases miracles. I'm not just a hearer, but I am a doer. I take action. I will apply this word, and I will manifest in Jesus' name. Somebody shout hallelujah. Amen. Psalm chapter 1, verse 3. Such a sweet, sweet, calm spirit in here today. Amen. That means I may not sweat. Hallelujah. And then we're going to go to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 as well. And both will be read in your hearing in the Amplified. Amen. And it should be on your screen. And the Bible says, And he shall be like a tree, firmly planted and tended by the streams of water, ready to bring forth its fruit in its season. Its leaf also shall not fade or wither. And everything he does shall prosper and come to maturity. Amen. Second Peter chapter 1 verse 3 says, For his divine power has bestowed upon us all things that are requisite and suited to both life and godliness. Through the full personal knowledge of him who called us by and to his own glory and excellence or virtue amen father we thank you and we honor you for your word bless us now speak to us now cause us to see what you've done by creating man and what it is you've mandated man to do and what you've graced man to become and to accomplish help us God to become more acquainted with plans and purposes that you have for knowledge of and have already made provision for before the foundation of the world. We love you, sir. We thank you. We thank you for hearts of purity and hearts of reconciliation and hearts of love and hearts of joy. And God, we just give you the praise, whether they seem good times or bad, because God, we know regardless of what's going on, you are in total control. We love you and we honor you, sir. In Jesus' name, amen. As you're taking your seat, just ask the person on your right and the left, who are you? Who are you? There's something about who God is, bless you, something about what God has done for us. And can I just start off by encouraging some people today that whatever you're dealing with, God already knows about it, that God's already got an answer for you, that God's already got something planned for you. I know you're sitting out there, blah, blah, but God's going to take care of you. Amen. All right, all right, so you don't want to do that. I wasn't going to do it, but just stand up and clap your hands then. I'm going I'm to get something out of you, if you because we serve an awesome God who is worthy to be praised. Now, prove that you love God for real and clap for the person next to you. Clap, clap for the person next to you. Tell them that God's got a way. God's got a ram in the bush. God knows what he's doing. God is in control of your situation. Let them know that no matter what hell you're going through, heaven is on the way. It has been taken notice. Uh, for something. Now I want some folk that really love God to shout for somebody you know needs a miracle but they're not here right now. Yeah, yeah. Somebody you know needs a move and a touch of God. They didn't show up this morning but you know they need God to move in their situation. Stuck in something. Needing something from God. And you're going to shout on their behalf this morning. You're going to give God some glory this morning because of what he's going to do in their life. Amen? Hallelujah. 
Amen. You may be seated. We are, uh, I believe, on the brink of something great. Because, you know, sometimes you just got to learn how to measure your hell. <laughs> when you don't see like, feel like or seem like you can see God, sometimes you got to measure the hell you're going through. And the hell you're going through has to be balanced with whatever God is desiring to do for your life. Amen. Anybody going through anything? Amen. If, if somebody next to you raised their hand, look back at them and said, you must be in, in line for a breakthrough. You must be in line for a breakthrough. Something is about to happen. I know, I know we get tired of the way things are going and tired of having to always deal with something else. It just seems like things keep popping up in our lives. And I recognize that we get sick of that sometimes. But if you came this morning with a spirit of expectation, I just believe that God's going to turn something around. I just believe that God is going to cause there to be a move that's going to shift in your situation. That's going to cause there what's been upside down is going to become right side up. God's going to shake loose a tree and some fruit going to fall. Amen. And I just believe I hear God shaking trees in the spirit. I don't know what you need. I don't know what kind of fruit it is. It might be money, but it might be joy. It might be peace. It might be whatever it is that you need. I believe I hear the tree shaking, slap five people and tell them shift happens. Shift happens. Shift happens. Shift happens. Yeah, it happens. Yeah. I know other stuff happens, but shift happens too. Yeah, it'll happen for you if you can trust God. Slap somebody and tell them like you mean it. Tell them shift happens. It happens. It happens. It happens. Shift happens. Yeah, yeah. I know what we used to say, but shift happens. Uh, even for the least of us. Even for those that have been. Listen, even if you caused your own captivity, shift happens. God knows how to bring you out of what you got yourself in. God knows how to help you when you can't help yourself. So I'm thankful to God that shift happens. Everybody say it, shift happens. Hallelujah. We thank you for that. Make sure you put that F in there. Make sure you put that F in. It's been an interesting month. It's been, been interesting. If you just watch what takes place in the atmosphere, it just takes place with the weather. Sometimes there's indications that this stuff is happening. Oh, in the past 30 days, we've, we've heard about earthquakes in Canada, and tsunamis in Hawaii. We know, of course, about Sandy and Nor'easter on the East Coast. Snow already trying to push itself in the Midwest uh, in footage, not inches, footage. Right after Sandy, Nor'easter came and just added insult to injury. New Jersey just starting to be able to see how to figure their way out of what Sandy did, and then here comes the threat of snow and ice. And oh yeah, the election. Yeah. <laughs> People's <laughs> lives altered and some lost and some feel hopeless and many in their greatest trial all around the world. Future looks dim as they try to sift through devastation and trepidation. Others, not just hit by physical storm, but just storms in general. Uh, just seems to be storm season. Uh, and people are trying to recover from life storms and things that have taken place, things that have come up on them kind of quickly and without real announcement. Uh, you know, even with the weather storms, there's always a prediction and a precaution that's given. People were uh, called to evacuate and to take cover and to leave cities and towns because they saw the thing coming. But what about the people that never see something coming? Uh, just going through life and all of a sudden a storm hits and uh, the very foundations of their peace and joy and uh, even their faith has been shook because something took, took place. and uh, So we got people going through storms, and people going through things and trying to figure out this life thing and trying to get their lives in order and just trying to map out what their next move is and trying to make decisions and choices and 
trying to figure out what they need to eliminate and then what they need to connect to and trying to get all their uh, situations in some type of alignment and order. And, and oh yeah, did I mention the election? <laughs> Millions of people around the world are feeling some kind of way about the local and national elections. Uh, one thing is for certain in Washington that the House is mostly Republican, the Senate is mostly Democrat, and the President is Barack Obama. Uh, that's without question. But I'm glad to know that while the Republicans control the House and the S Democrats control the Senate, and President Obama controls the war, that God controls the world. I'm, uh, I'm glad to know that regardless of how we voted and what we think about anything, that Jehovah is in control. I'm thankful to know that. And so uh, we, we recognize that God is sovereign. And on yesterday, early in the morning, I met with a group of profound and astute theologians and we discussed the pros and cons of the election outcomes. And uh, Regardless of what side anybody took, there was one conclusion that we all agreed upon and that's that we must pray and that the church has to step up. Uh, that it's our role in the earth. This one might bore you this morning. It's more foundation to where we're going as we're talking about the character of the church. We're in an interesting time. People of God must take an opportunity to allow God to use you. This is the time where we've got to connect with the spirit and the endeavors of heaven. It's where we've got to get back to our original purpose. And we're trying to do this, some folk sitting in church buildings and institutions of religious activity while we're witnessing such lethargy and apathy in the church. People who are claiming to be spiritual, but yet who remain disengaged and non-submitted. Doing their own thing and having their own agenda, but saying that they love God and that they hear from God and that they're led by God, but yet you can't find them around God's stuff. People who regard rumor as real and truth as trivial. Wow. People who would rather spread gossip than the good news of Jesus Christ. People who enjoy inviting folk into foolishness more than inviting souls to church and ultimately to Christ. Something's got to change. Uh, something's got to shift as it relates to us understanding that the heavens belong to God, but he's given the earth to the sons of men and that we've got to become responsible citizens of heaven that while we're on this sojourn in the earth ram and on planet earth that there are some responsibilities that we have to take and take seriously because without taking responsibility we view lose our purposeful, purposefulness in the earth uh, God has deemed to use us and to use us in a mighty way not to just let us loose to do what we want to do. I know it's your thing, but you really can't do what you want to do. And we can't allow the situations that we're in, we can't allow things that are happening around us to keep us from embracing what God has for us. And when you talk about church, I know I'm shifting a little bit, when you talk about church, it's not this come, feel happy, clap your hands place. Uh, it's a place where we are supposed to be engaged and invigorated and filled up with purpose and the plans and the promises of God so that when we leave this place that we would have influence outside the walls. Amen. We didn't come because it's politically correct or religiously right. We came so that God could correct some areas of our lives, challenge us in where we become mundane, and then push us into the mainstream of the marketplace so that we would represent him and take the light that we were infused with on the inside, we take it outside to the world. Yeah. Haven't you noticed that Jesus didn't say you was the light of the church? <laughs> he yeah. said you was the light 
of the world. And it's funny that people only click their light on when they show up in here. Some folk are scared to be saved outside the church. Yeah, yeah. And I understand why, because we make mistakes. We, 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 we cause error in our own lives and in the lives of others. So we don't want to be hypocritical. We don't want folk to talk about us, and so we hide our Christianity under the shamefulness and the guilt of our own stumblings and bumblings. But I got news for you. You saved anyway. And so the people need to recognize, they need to understand that God has you on a mandate with a perfect gospel in imperfect vessels. Ah, that's not a license and it's not an opportunity and we're not condoning that you live and do whatever you want to and say, oh, uh, I'm just human. That's not what we're saying, but I am saying you can't let that be your excuse for not being who God called you to be. I'd rather somebody out there scoff than to have God shake his head. I'd hate to get a text from God that says S-M-H. I'd hate to look up in my prayer life and realize that God is not happy with me and that when I die, he won't be able to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. So we can't allow our present conditions and circumstances to keep us from doing what God wants us to do. And I just figured that today that somebody just needed to be encouraged that God chose you for a reason. Yeah. yeah. He didn't choose you and said, if you get right. He chose you and said, I'm going to get you right while you're doing what I ask you to do. I'm always amazed at the story of the 10 lepers that they came to Jesus and Jesus asked them, basically asked everybody, what do you want? And they came to him for healing. And the Bible does not declare that while they were standing in his presence, they got healed. The Bible declares that Jesus said, go show yourself to the priest. Now, by, by virtue of my understanding of Scripture, yeah. and I understand that certain things are not said but definitely implied, you know that if I came to Jesus marred and jacked up, and all Jesus said to me was, go show yourself to the priest, I would probably first look down at myself. Recognizing that even though I'm in the presence of Jesus, ain't nothing changed yet. You ever been in prayer and when you first come out of prayer, you still feel like you felt when you first got down to pray? I, listen, listen, when you got down to pray, you was black. When you got up from prayer, you were still black. Whatever you wore to prayer meeting is what you walked out in prayer meeting in. So it's not so much that when they got in the presence of Jesus that the change occurred because without works, your faith is dead. He proclaimed the change, but then when he told them to go show themselves to the priest the Bible says as they walked there was something that happened as they moved in what God has said the reason why so many people come to church and you leave the same way that you came in is because when you got in the presence of God you were looking for change but everything looked the same you didn't know that God was drying it up from the root and even though it looked the same you had to leave out with a new mentality that whatever God proclaimed I'm walking in it right now I dare you just to get up and take two high steps and say I'm walking in it right now. Whatever God has proclaimed over your life, if it's physical healing, financial healing, relationship healing, slap 10 people and tell them I'm walking in it right now. I might not look different. I might not feel different. But after I leave the presence of God, I'm walking in whatever he says. Somebody shout hallelujah. Yeah, it's time for the people of God to walk in it. It's time for us to believe God on another level, in another dimension, that we can't just take what it looks like to be my truth. If God said it, then that settles it. So in this present condition, can I prophesy? In this atmosphere, can I tell you? That it doesn't matter what it looks like. The plans and promises and the purposes of God are yes and amen. So I want to speak in this atmosphere because some of y'all are so freaking spiritual that it scares me. You think the only thing that God wants to do is to raise you up in the church. If 
all we got is the church uh, and this institution and this building. Uh, we really ain't got much at all. But God wants to raise you up uh, in the community and in society. God wants his presence known all over the world. Uh, I don't know about you, but I know one thing. I know Barack Obama is the president, uh, but if he don't get a prophet in his life, uh, ain't nothing gonna change. Uh, so I need a prophet uh, that's an elected official. Uh, I need a prophet uh, that's secretary of state. I can't depend on all the prophets to just be in church. Ah, so I prophesy that God's getting ready to use some people. And you're not just going to be an evangelist, you're going to be an entrepreneur. <laughs> that God is releasing anointing, not for you just to be a prophet, but for you to get promotions on your job and have positions of influence. <laughs> that God is not just anointing you to be a preacher and a teacher, but God wants you to be CEO uh, of some company. God wants some government officials that love him. I'm talking about God anointing us not just to be missionaries, but to be millionaires. Uh, is there anybody out there uh, that wouldn't mind the anointing to be a millionaire? Or you might prophesy in the church, uh, but you're going to do business in the marketplace. Somebody shout hallelujah. Yeah. We're talking about God. We're talking about God. You just want God to do it so church folk can see you. <sighs> but what about the world? What about the influence and the impact that we're going to have on society? Oh, God, make me an evangelist. God, make me an entrepreneur. Uh, God, don't let me just get folks saved, but help me feed my family. Uh, Y'all ain't going to help me. God, do something that's going to allow me to have influence with people who don't normally get to hear your voice. Yeah, we so worried about who at the church know we anointed. Uh, that got quiet. You so worried, I'm going to say it again. It got quiet, so I'm going to say it again. You so worried about who at the church knows that you're anointed. If the only people that know you're anointed are in the church, you really ain't anointed. <laughs> anointed is when you get near a devil and they say, No! <laughs> don't mess with me. If ain't no devil scared of you, I don't know about your anointing. Funny how we got more folk in the church in the church scared of people's anointing than we do devils. Yeah. Now, you know, some people use their anointing. <sighs> I'm just saying in the wrong way. But I prophesy that God's going to give us strength in the marketplace that we're going to be able to make differences around the world that we're going to be in the ear of important people that's a shame I said I just prophesied that but God's getting ready to get us next to some people who can actually make things happen might not get the electoral votes, but you'll be the one elected by the one who's been elected. Yeah. Yeah. To speak truth to power. That's why it's important that we understand what God desires. That's why it's important that we understand who we are in Christ. That's why it's important don't take for granted that what God wants to do with you will have a global impact. I don't have no problem encouraging Ray Ray and Pookie. But I believe that if I let him, that he might put me in the presence of Jeremy Lipstein. <laughs> that he might allow me to get in the presence of some people who actually can turn some things around. Not for a house, 
before a city. Oh, I love talking to the generals and the mayors of the neighborhood. But wouldn't it be good if the mayor didn't make a move until he called you? And I'm not saying that you want that for prestige or power. I'm saying that you're allowing God to use you to his full potential. That you're not just categorizing yourself <clears throat> based on what somebody else said about you. I believe in 2012 and 13, we're going to see some surprises in the church. And if we're not careful, folk are going to become jealous at how God raises up faithful people. Ah, not the most talented, not the most articulate, not the most educated, but faithful to God and the things of God. People who have surrendered themselves to God's use, people who have humbled themselves to authority as God has assigned to you. So understanding who you are is critical in this hour. Recognizing who you are gives insight to your purpose, kind of backing up what I had two weeks ago. Not knowing your purpose in this season could run you into dangerous territory. You ever recognize that when you live non-purposefully, you find yourself in bad situations, hooked up and in covenant with people that don't have purpose, people that don't have destiny mindsets, people who are not looking to see where God is trying to take them and all y'all talk about is going in circles, doing the same old, same old. Never challenged to think outside of your own box. Never stretched or challenged to think about things from another perspective. All you got is your broke check to check mentality. Jesus. Never expecting God to do something super superfluous in your life that will take you from no money to a lot of money. All you got is your conversation of your lonely singleness and how pitiful it is to be by yourself and you've never talked and had an expectation of God bringing Boaz into your life and dropping some wheat and barley behind the worker so that you would begin to glean to one day find yourself at the foot of somebody that can make something happen in your life and while you was picking up particles that people had dropped off you didn't know you was walking on the field that you had once owned that's why God said wherever your feet shall trod you God will give you the territory I don't know if anybody in here asked Ruth but I wonder if Ruth knew that while she was walking around and picking up scraps uh, she was declaring what God was about to give to her you might be scrapping now but you about to own it in the morning somebody shout hallelujah you got to see yourself in another position and posture in life. You've got to believe that God wants to do something miraculous with you. Don't care where you come from and what you've been dealing with. God has a plan and he calls it an expected end. God says that it's a plan of shalom, not just peace but prosperity, a plan of good success and a plan of virtue and vitality that will allow you to keep going when everybody else would quit. I don't know about you, but sometimes I'm just thankful that God gives me a I can't quit anointing. I'm, I don't know about you, but I'm just thankful that when I feel like throwing in the towel, the anointing rises up and says, you can't throw in the towel. You ain't even got quit in you no more. You'll say you ain't going back in your car or take you up to the church. Ain't no somebody say, ain't no quit in me. Ain't no quit in me. Ain't no quitting in me. God is looking for some ain't going to quit people. Folk that's on the verge of quitting, but you know you can't quit. People who put their fingernails in the threshold not to allow somebody to pull them away. Folk who would tie their arms to the horns of the altar. So even if their lives are shook tumultuously, they still got a hold of what's got a hold on them. So God is saying, but you've got to know who you are. 
You got to know why you're in existence. If not, you'll keep finding yourself in danger. See, because the truth of the matter is, most people who have come to the knowledge of God and then find themselves in abusive situations find themselves there because they were already abusing themselves. I'm not just talking about physical or sexual. I'm talking about mental and emotional and financial and relational. You only get abused once you've come to the knowledge of Christ because you've been abusing yourself. You've been putting yourself in the wrong situations. You've been hooking up with the wrong person. You've been talking to the wrong people. You've given covenant to the wrong covenant breaker. One thing amiss of conversation yesterday that there was agreement that we must seek ye first the kingdom of God and when you're doing that there's a process that takes place not only do you ask God what he wants you get a reminder of who you are and so you begin to line up who you are with what you're doing and with what you're doing don't add up to who you are look at your neighbor and say stop it There are some things that we've got to realize about our own personal lifestyles and our own personal ways of thinking that are not uh, conducive to who God has already called us to be. If God has called you healed, then you got to quit crying that you're sick. If God has already called you delivered, you got to quit whining that you're caught up. If God has already said you're free, you got to quit claiming that you're in bondage you've got to allow God to do what God says he's doing in your life and you've got to begin to declare it over yourself the Bible says that when they came to Ziklag and they took peace and joy from David those were his two wife's names when they took peace and joy from David the Bible says he cried until he couldn't cry no more I'm glad that God eventually even when he don't wipe away my tears he let them dry up because ain't none left and then after you can't cry no more and after there's no more tears anymore you either need to die or encourage yourself in the Lord and the Bible says I shall live and not die and declare the works of the Lord so I don't know about you if you done cried yourself silly in this place I dare you to stand up right now and encourage yourself in the Lord you don't need no preacher you don't need no psalmist you don't need no song you don't need no choir you need to encourage yourself in the Lord you need to spin for yourself you need to jump for yourself you need to grab yourself back on the back of your head and shout glory you need to do something that will encourage yourself you need to pat your own self on the back you need to raise your own hands and encourage yourself somebody say i'm healed Whatever that's been ailing you, God says that somewhere along the line, you got to begin to speak to yourself. Ah, because lonely times are around all of us. When you feel like you need somebody else to speak in your life, might not be that they don't want to, they might be busy. Yesterday, talking to a brother and he left and I was eating people left and folk in and out of the green room and I got a phone call and somebody called and I looked I was busy they called again and I looked and I was busy and so they called a third time it was quickly and I picked up they said I've just I've been calling you you wouldn't answer I said, I know. They said, what was wrong? I said, I was busy. They said, but when you saw I called that many times, you had to know it was an emergency. I said, I know. I figured it was. They said, why you didn't pick up the phone? I said, because I was in an emergency. And I figured if I didn't encourage myself first, I couldn't encourage you. So how many of you know that if you don't keep yourself encouraged, you ain't no good to nobody else, huh? 
because I don't want your blood. I want your scab. I don't want you rubbing your blood on me. I want your scab to rub up against me. That way I know that whatever was bleeding from you, God done dried that thing up. I need you to understand that you got to have a scab ministry. Tell your neighbor, you got a scab ministry? You got to don't do, don't touch me if you ain't got no scab ministry. If you don't have stuff dried up. I see disease, disease is transferred by the blood. So sometimes before you can try to deal with everybody else, you got to encourage yourself. So the Bible tells us that we've got to live purposefully. And I said already that it's critical in this hour. And if we don't, we'll find ourselves running into dangerous territory. But if we, if we find that place... In God, I had someone prophesy to me that the birds, uh, they, they, they fly because they find that place. And it allows them to just move along vigorously and move along vehemently and move along with almost violent acceleration going from a cold place to a warm place. Because they found that place. They found that, 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 that angle where the wind gets beneath their wings. And even though the, 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 the flight seems vigorous, it's almost without strain because once they flap, then they let the wind do the work. Kind of like us, once we walk, we let the word do the work. But we've got to walk, the Bible says in Ephesians 5, circumspectly or circumspectly. We've got to walk with intention. We've got to walk accurately and we've got to walk with purpose and so purpose is synonymous with use and I gave you this definition before but I'll give you again the word use in Webster means the legal enjoyment and arrangement of property that consists of a suitable and favorable attitude for skillful employment practical and peculiar utilization and or profitable service as an instrument with both benefit of achieving and an established end. So in other words, usefulness or use means that someone has the legal enjoyment and arrangement of owning you because you have both a suitable and favorable attitude that God can skillfully employ you and utilize what he's put in you both practically and with peculiarity and that ultimately it's going to be a profitable service because you are an instrument of both benefit of achievement and you have an established end and so when God is talking about using us he's talking about building up instruments of righteousness that are going to achieve whatever it is he has declared. Uh, Jeremiah said, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord. And so uh, we've read scriptures in Corinthians that talk about uh, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, the very sanctuary of the Holy Spirit. It's not the physical part of you that's a piece of property. Uh, belonging to the uh, physical part of you, not a piece of property belonging to the spiritual part of you, but God owns all of you. Amen. So it's not that you get to do with your body and your life what you desire as long as you call it spiritual. But it's about allowing yourself to be surrendered to God that God could do whatever he wants in and through our lives. So to not understand uh, our proper use of a thing can be very dangerous and we've said it over and over again. It leads to the word that Miles Monroe uh, broke down for us years ago from an etymological standpoint when he said abuse is nothing more than abnormal use and it causes us to be out of place and to live out of character because God has outfitted us with a mantle of purpose. Uh, last week we talked about uh, being reniggers and so we don't want to be a reniger we want to be people 
who are in suit. Amen. Amen. You know, some of y'all holy people just lost your mind, but that's what it is when you play out of suit. Ron told us this, so don't blame it on me. He said it years ago, when you play out of suit, you renege. And it just kind of gave me a revelation when I got up behind him and said, I don't want to be a renegger. I want to play in suit. So God has given all of us, listen, a mantle of purpose. A mantle of purpose. And what I've learned about the episcopacy, what I've learned about the bishopric, and what I've learned about what God has done in my life as I go from consecration to consecration and being a part of those, that the mantle is the first thing people see, but it's the last thing that gets put on. And so the reason why most people aren't walking in purpose is because they've never put on the prerequisites. And so people who are not worshipers looking for purpose, you ain't going to find it. Because the first thing that's put on the episcopacy is the mantle of worship or the, the, cloak, the cloak of worship. Amen. And then there's a belt of humility. So that you can serve because this is what Jesus used to wipe the feet of the apostles. And then God puts on uh, a cloak that will allow you now to be a prophet. And then God puts on a cloak that will allow you to be a priest. And so the difference between the prophet and the priest is that the prophet hears from God to speak to the people. But the priest hears from the people to speak to God. And so you've got to have on these cloaks before you can have this mantle. So God is saying that the problem with our mantle of purpose is that we have not allowed God to process us uh, correctly. And so that's why it's important that if I'm going to have purpose, I must already be a worshiper. If I'm going to have purpose, I've got to already have a relationship where I can talk with God. If I'm going to walk in purpose, I've got to already be prophetic enough in the Holy Ghost that when God's ready to use me, I'm able to be used. Uh, because, see, God can't mantle people with purpose who are going to abuse other people. You've got to have all the cloaks on first before God will release the mantle. Of purpose, but the mantle of purpose is already prepared for everybody in the room. So God doesn't prepare it as your life goes along. Before your life got here, He created you to walk in that mantle. But there's prerequisite to get to it because there has to be some level of spiritual qualification that gets you there. And aren't you glad that God is the qualifier? Aren't you glad that you don't have to work your way to God, that God has already bent himself down to you by way of Jesus Christ and the cross? He has already made it available that you would be reconciled with God even after you done acted a fool. I, I should have said after you got saved and acted a fool. Yeah, now, you, now you get better shouts. Yeah. Yeah, because a lot of y'all want to talk about B.C., bump B.C., yeah. bump before Christ. I'm talking about saved, tongue-talking, Holy Ghost, field folk, people that's walking in the Spirit. You can walk frontwards and backwards in the Holy Ghost. You can do handstands. You prophesy, evangelize, witness, and soul say you still got a little sin residue in you. And when you blow it, the Bible says, regardless of the blood or not, you, your wages of sin is death. And so aren't you glad that once you You've tasted the goodness of God and you sin again that he don't take his blood back from you that he don't make you get saved all over again but if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart you're saved and then after you're saved and fall if you confess your sins he's faithful and just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness aren't you glad we've got a God that's full of mercy because most of us should have died last night Except for the real holy people, you should have died last week. You didn't have six days that you've been working it right. But 
But I like the way Jesus makes it inclusionary when he speaks of those who ought to be thankful of his mercy. He said, even if you thought about it, you need to ask for forgiveness, even if it went through your head. When she walked by and you was thinking it, you got to repent or your worship is witchy. When he walked down the aisle, you got to say, Lord, forgive me. Oh, I know not what I do. So man is a created being, created by God in the image of God. You know, we could read Genesis 1, 26 and 27 forever. But you read it on your leisure over and over and over again. It's something that I've learned to read on a consistent basis because there's something called the law of first mention that when God says something in Genesis as a truth, it's good all the way to the book of Revelation. It's good for the rest of my life. And so when I read that God made me in his own image, that means that every day I'm being conformed back to the image of God. God, listen, God's not trying to create something in me. He's trying to get something recreated in me. He's trying to get me back to how I was originally designed. When he released me through the womb, there was already an image that he had picked for me. And it was the image of his Christ. And so I'm thankful that we were created in the image of God. So we owe our existence to God. God is both the creator, the progenitor, and the sustainer of all things and all men. No man is self-existent and can live independently. Everyone is dependent upon God and God's provision. Amen. I talked to a pastor the other day, and we were just talking about people in the church who don't understand uh, the importance and how we sometimes as pastors don't under understand the importance of our positions in people's lives because God in his providing has provided pastors to the flock and some people think they're just so spiritual and holy they don't need pastors they don't need a heart of God to speak to them they don't need a voice I can do this on my own that ain't how God set it up I mean, the pastors probably didn't ask to be pastors, but that's how God set it up. Because if we could trade right now and I don't go to hell, I'll give you the mic, right? Yes, sir. Now. Yes, sir. Somebody say that one. Oh. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm allowing God to prune and I'm trying to get my eyes on a couple people right now. I think y'all do good with a singing pastor. I think y'all do good with a bald head pastor. A little under 5'8". Five, 5'7". Five, I think y'all could move a long way. It was all, God almost got it right. I'm bald headed and I got MC in the front of my name. But I think he wanted call more than guar. He's trying to get the call. Oh, shoot, that might have been a revelation. Everybody said, but call. <laughs> yeah, that might be a revelation. But God has connected church and pastor, sheep and shepherds flocks and overseers for a reason. See, because without an overseer, the sheep would just go astray. And without sheep, the shepherd wouldn't be anointed. God always reminds me, I'm not anointed to leave y'all, I'm anointed to lead y'all. I, I, if, if, if I stop doing what God called me to do, the anointing goes. Okay, okay, since y'all don't like me talking about me, I'll talk about y'all. <laughs> if you've been anointed to do something and you ain't doing it, the anointing gonna leave. Yeah. Yeah. So if God called you to be a greeter, you better greet. Yeah. If he called you to be a dancer, you better dance. If he called you to sing, you better sing. If he called you to witness, you better witness. And a lot of y'all don't understand that everybody that's saved been anointed to witness. And if you're not witnessing, you're going to lose the anointing that's been helping your life thus far. Because the anointing ain't just for you. It's first for you, but it ain't just 
for you. So many of us are abusing our anointing. God has given it to us to do a particular thing, but because it comes with process and it comes with suffering, we don't want to do it. Uh, it doesn't always come with joy and, and uh, a lot of uh, adoration, and we don't get a lot of applause. We don't want to do what God has called us to do. But God has made us interdependent on one another, so somebody on your row is anointed for you this morning. Uh, the praise that's coming out of somebody else might encourage your praise this morning. Because you can be honest, sometimes you don't even feel like praising God, but then some kind of way you see somebody that's praising God that's been going through, and it kind of ignites your praise because you figure if they can still praise him, I ought to praise him. And you almost get a holy jealousy. You, you wasn't going to even stand up. I don't feel like praising him. Then you look across the room and be like, oh, my God. And before you know it, you're up clapping your hands too because you know if they can give God some glory. Yeah then there must be some glory that I've got to give him. So God says that we're dependent on him and his provision. And so we already understand that it's in him we live and move and have our being according to Acts 17 and that God made us as triune beings just as he is a triune being. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. We're almost done for the day, but over the next few weeks, we're just going to talk about who we are. The Bible says, may God himself, uh, in the Message Bible, the God who makes everything holy and whole, make you holy and whole, put you together, spirit, soul, and body, and keep you fit for the coming of our master, Jesus Christ. The one who called you is completely dependable. If he said it, he'll do it. That's good news for me, huh? I know it was the message Bible, but that sounds like good news to me. It could have been the good news Bible. But spirit, soul, and body, God has made us. And he's made us and keeping us fit for his return. And whatever God has promised to do, God is able to complete it. The spirit is the portion of man that goes back to God. It's where our conscience and intuition and our place with fellowship of the Holy Spirit and God himself takes place. Then man has a soul. That's where the mind and the will and the emotions of man is. It's the eternal part of man that when you die, your soul is going to be eternally either in, in life or in dying. Ah, that's the wonderful thing about God is that he's given us eternal life. But the dangerous thing about not believing him, being condemned already, the Bible says in John chapter 3, 18, is that when we die, if we did not die in the faith, that we'll feel like dying but can't. Because the soul will be eternal where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Some folks say that that's a cruel God and when you die, your soul dies. No, that's the choice that you make. Because the soul is eternal. It never dies. Once the soul became alive, it never dies. It either has eternal life or it has eternal damnation. That's the chance that people are taking, not accepting Christ as their personal savior. That they're saying, I don't mind that my soul would suffer forever and it's something like we've never felt before I was in Texas it was 103 degrees in the wind I said what's going on down here I said it's hotter than heck then I was just riding it quite simply God said not even close shook me just to think about how I couldn't even take it and I had air condition on and fans blowing and I bought one of them little things that spit out water we would use at King's Island I just bought it at the airport I said right, it's hot when we landed in Texas you could feel the heat on the plane I thought about that rich man that was asking Lazarus to just put a piece just put some water on my tongue help me I'm Dying, and just to imagine that place. So man has a soul, but then man also has a body. It's what we see. It's what we look at. It's the personage. It's, it's the visage. It's, it's the outer cover. It's the house that the person lives in. And this particular house goes back to the dust. And the dust it came, and the dust it shall return. And we recognize that in Ecclesiastes 12 and 7. So the spirit goes back to God uh, who gave it, and the body goes to the dust uh, where 
uh, it came from. And so this soul matter is what we have to deal with is what's going to happen to our soul. You know, uh, scriptures like what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul to eternal damnation. So we got a soul issue. Look at your neighbor and say, I got soul issues. <laughs> you know, I was going to put issues behind it. So we got soul issues. So it's our mind and our will and our emotions. So man is a being that does have reason and intelligence and imaginations and the ability to express both thoughts and language. That's what makes us different than animals because animals have nothing more than habits and instincts. But isn't it funny that we have been designed much more than the animal, yet we act animalistically. We act like we're not intelligent enough to recognize that some of our habits and our instincts are getting us in trouble, trouble, trouble. So God is saying that he's made us distinctively. He's given us of this place. We also recognize that as man, we are moral beings that have a free will. Uh, we talked about it yesterday, volition uh, God has granted us. But because there's so many choices in the world, we find ourselves choosing the wrong things too often. And so God has given us this ability to choose, and he's made man moral, and therefore we become responsible. Uh, because God, uh, in his existence and in the proof of his existence, there's a moral fiber that God has given to every man that couldn't have come from a big bang or from evolution. I know what your children have to learn in school, but it's a lie. Uh, we were not created because some, some things came together and blew up, and then some monkeys showed up, uh, and you walked around on fours and then eventually became upright and, uh, you know, all that stuff, homo sapiens and all that kind of stuff that you learn. And I don't even know how relevant it is because there is no way that God could take a monkey and do what he's doing with some of y'all. Amen. I'm not, I'm not, I, w I wasn't calling you a monkey. I'm saying he couldn't have used no monkey uh, to allow uh, him, his glory to be received in the earth uh, by what he's doing with some of your lives. I was actually giving you a compliment. Your mind is jacked up. I was actually trying to say that there's no way that you could have just kind of haphazardly showed up here and God's using you the way yeah. he's using you. Yeah. Ain't nothing wrong with knowing that God is using you. Ain't nothing wrong with understanding that God has chosen you for a particular purpose. But we have this free will and this power of choice, and uh, it can get us in so much trouble. You know, I think a lot of times we do better. You know, children do better when you eliminate choices. And God has said, you know, you can pick whatever you want uh, because I want you to love me freely. Uh, I want you to love me voluntarily. But he's also said, choose you this day who you am going to serve. Choose before life and death, blessings and cursing. So we have this thing of volition, but we got to be careful of what we choose because most of our choices, all of our choices but one in every situation have dangerous consequences. Amen. And most of us, if we be honest, we're living out of some of the consequences of bad choices. And sometimes they last a long time. And uh, we have to work through it and trust God in it. Amen. I was going to say something, but you might be sitting next to him. I didn't want to say it. Man uh, has emotions. Our emotions involve our feelings. You know, they can be good or bad. Uh, they, they create our behavior. They create our attitude. It's a shame to have anointed people with bad attitudes. A lot of times churches don't develop and grow because not of economic barriers, but attitudinal barriers. Because folk can't get along who are all anointed. Don't that sound like an oxymoron? Anointed animosity. <laughs> don't that sound retarded? I'm not saying somebody's retarded, but that sounds retarded yeah. to have anointed animosity. My English language doesn't allow me to allow that to make sense, but that's where we are because we're full of emotions. We're emotional people. We, we kind of made a statement in class yesterday. It's because of our emotional soul ties, the things that a lot of times keep us spiritually dysfunctional. 
we're so caught up in emotion and so caught up with what's going on and how it's making us feel that we can't do or say what God desires. Yeah. And so we've got to get someplace where we can reciprocate the love of God back to God and to all that God loves. Amen. Amen. And so that, that, that void that we have because of this lack of love or because of this created love that we're not reciprocating to God is the other reason other than not having purpose is what causes us to go after illicit things. Uh, this void that we have that's empty and void. You know, it's just like the earth was. It was empty and void, but the Bible says the spirit was ready to move. And for some of us, we're not allowing the spirit to move. Uh, I mean, I told you this would be boring, but I'm trying to help you get to a place that, that would allow you to begin to get cloaked in the right things so that we can begin to walk in purpose. Because if we're connected and some of us are not walking in purpose, we're going to pull the whole line back. I know, I know y'all wanted me to dance and shout. I couldn't do it this morning. Uh, John, 1 John chapter 4, 18 and 19. There is no fear in love. It doesn't dread, it does not exist. But full grown, complete, perfect love turns fear out of doors and expels every trace of terror. For fear brings with it the thought of punishment. And so he who is afraid has not reached the full maturity of love, is not yet grown into love's complete perfection. We love him because he first loved us. It's also the same thing in personal relationships. We learn or grow to love somebody because the love they've shown to us. But we cannot fear in that love because it brings with it punishment. The King James uh, says it brings forth torment. And we've got to allow the love of God and the love that we have toward God to secure us that no matter what we're going through, somebody say God loves me. Loves yeah, no matter what I'm dealing with, somebody say God loves me. Yeah. No matter what people say about me, somebody say, God loves me. Yeah, and no matter what the devil's trying to convince me in my own mind, somebody say, God loves me. Yeah, and that's part of the problem with most of us is we have too many conversations with the devil. We ain't going to want to admit that, but we say that we're trying to process things ourselves, but either you got a devil in your head or the devil is talking to your consciousness. It's either one, and you can, you can pick the one, but that's the problem with most of us. We're having too many long conversations with the devil because the conversation is absent of love. I'm not saying all of us are prone for the devil to try to talk to us, but when you hear the devil talking, somebody shouts, shut up. Shut up. Yeah. Learn how to say it to the devil the same way we say it to each other. I'm going to help some people right here. Our religious folk going to be mad. The next time the devil say something to you, say, shut the hell up. Yeah, bringing that hell to me, putting that hell in my mind, putting that hell in my spirit, trying to make me imagine hellish situations, trying to make me see the hell in everybody else. Shut the hell up. Now put that on the tape. God loves me. God desires for me to prosper. He desires for me to move forward. He desires for me to uh, come to full fruition and to mature and to develop in the thing that he had already progenerated about me from the foundation of the world. That's God's expectation. Yeah. It's not God's expectation that we fail or fall short. That's not God's expectation of us. That's not God's desire that we don't attain or get to the place that he's already promised us. Sometimes I get frustrated with people who just get limp in their, in their vigor and get limp in their go get it and get limp in their belief that God desires for them to go somewhere else. This ain't all God's got for you. I mean, you can be content and we can shout and we can be thankful, but this ain't it. If this all God got, then take me on to heaven. But if there's more, then let's live on, let's breathe on, let's move on. But there's got to be something else God wants to do with my life. Can't just be a preacher We're up here wearing tight suits for the rest of my life. Something else has to be in my future. Some pecs and some, some biceps and some six packs. Gotta be somewhere in my future. I'm gonna try to exercise my 
privilege in his anointing and his grace, but I ain't going to be fat forever. Got to be something else that God wants from me. Got to be something else. God is telling me, he said, look, I want a 12 pack. I want a 12 pack. I want a got to be something else. It's got to be more than check to check. It's got to be more than arguing with folk. It's got to be more than bad relationships. It's got to be more than wayward children. It's got to be more than hunting for a job. It's got to be more than hating that I'm alive. It's got to be more than the hell I got to fight through. It's got to be more than people I can't trust. It's got to be more than folk walking out on me. It's got to be more than this. This can't be the whole kid and caboodle. God's got to have something stored away, hidden away, just for me. I thank God that on one of those early nights of those first 31 days of preaching, Kenny Ma said, Your stuff ain't gone, it's just planted. It's just down deep in the earth. So God's gonna get us to that place. He's going to cause us to find it. He's going to get us there. And I just believe that God is, is doing that, that he's developed us into a full-grown man and woman who he loves and that we love him back enough to surrender our lives to him. So for the next few weeks, we're going to keep talking about who man is because we got to get a sense of who we are in him. I know it might bore you, but I promise if you can make it through the next couple of weeks, uh, that I believe God's going to begin to open heaven up over you. I, I'm not saying it so you show up, because if it's just three of us in here, Jesus is in the midst. I ain't, I ain't tripping on numbers. I don't trip on how many folks show up to church. I, that's not even on my repertoire. I don't even care. I, 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 Y'all know what I want to say. I don't give a flip. I, it's just, it's just, I just want to say what God wants me to say. I just want to be what God wants me to be. And while I'm stumbling and bumbling along, I'm not going to keep my eyes off the thing that I believe God said. And if there's a group of people that want to come in real connection with who you are and why you're in existence and you're tired of going around this same mountain, you're tired of making progress and then bumping your head, you're tired of getting ahead and feel like the world just fell on you and you forget what manner of man you are every time pressure and tough times come. If you're still picking up drugs, picking up a woman, picking up a man, picking up food, picking up liquor, and you're still picking up cigarettes trying to get your nerves right because you don't know what the flip going on with your life, I'm saying there's delay deliverance in this house today there's a way that you can get what God's got for you if you're using stuff and tools and things to try to cause there to be an ease and a calm because you're confused about your being and who you are over the next couple of weeks I'm going to try to allow God to lay a foundation that you might be able to look in the mirror and begin to jump for joy and tell the devil he's a liar that I am wonderfully and fearfully made and that God's got a purpose and plan for my life and all the promises of God are yes and amen. Somebody shout hallelujah. There's something that God is ready to do. There's something that God is ready to reveal to every person that's in this room, but you've got to be in the posture for revelation. You've got to know there's something God wants to say to you and something that God wants to do through you. Let me tell you something. Getting saved is ultimate. But if you're still alive, there's more than just being saved. It's why were you saved? Why were you rescued? Fulfilling purpose in God. It's paramount. You read the scriptures. The Bible says David fulfilled the will of God. In his own generation. There's something that God wants us to do before we take off for heaven. Before we take off this mortal body and put on immortality. Before we're changed in the twinkling of an eye. There's something that God wants us to accomplish in the earth. And it's essential. But it's not only essential for your eternal life, but it's essential for the life of the people that God has connected to your purpose and your plan. 
You don't want to be the one that's responsible for generations of people not knowing God and not walking in purpose because you didn't walk in yours. And I don't want you to look so externally. Your own house is dependent on you walking in purpose. Just because you fed them and clothed them don't mean you gave them what God wanted you to give them if they didn't see purpose being fulfilled in your life. God wants that. He wants us to be that model and example of purpose and destiny. Amen? Amen. It's time to give. It's time to go. But there's some people in this room right now, and if this is not you, don't come. But if it's you, don't stop. Don't not come. That are actually frustrated with purpose. You can be a deacon, you can be an elder, you can be a preacher, a pastor, you can be an evangelist, but you're at a place in your life where you're trying to figure out, God, okay, 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 what, what, what now? What next? I'm trying to figure this out. I, I got a good job. I got, I got a decent family. I got, things are working out. And things are going well. But I, I'm, I'm what, what next? I'm saved. I love you. I'm full of the Holy Ghost. I speak in tongues. Matter of fact, you use me sometime at the market. I prophesy to people and I've led people to Christ. But it's just something about what I'm really designed to do. I'm I'm trying to find it again. I had it. Then some stuff happened and I lost it. I was was on my way. It seemed like I was hearing you, but then something happened. I I was in it actually, but then things shifted. And now I'm not quite sure what's going on. Or God, I'm I'm at a place where I've got no job, I've got no family, I've got nothing going on. I'm trying to figure out all I really got going on is coming to church. But it's got to be more than that. There's got to be something else. I'm I'm okay if you're developing me, if you're restoring me, if you're healing me, if you're delivering me, if you're preparing me. But for what? What do I do next? Where do I go from here? Do I just sit? I'm trying to shout. I'm trying to worship. I'm trying to sing. I'm trying to dance. But I'm running out of breath because I don't know what it's all about. So God, today, just speak to us. Just speak to us, God. Speak to us. Speak to us about purpose. Speak to us about purpose, God. Speak to us about purpose. Speak to us, God. Who am I? What did you create me for? I'm so thankful to be saved, God. I'm so thankful to have your spirit. I'm so thankful to speak in tongues. I'm so thankful, God, that you speak to me in the midnight hour sometimes. I'm so thankful for your word. I'm so thankful for my prayer life. But God, I want to line it up with purpose. I need something, God. I need a fresh word. I need something spoken in my life. Not necessarily just prophesied by a man. But I need to hear from the wind of heaven who I am. I need to begin to see direction. I need a light, God, at the end of my tunnel. I'm not scared of the tunnel. I'll walk through the tunnel. I'll trust you in the tunnel. But I need a light at the end of my tunnel. What do you want me to do next? I've got some dreams. I've got some hopes. I've got some aspirations. I've got some plans. I've got some ways. I've got some endeavors. I've got some stuff I can do, but I need to know, is this you or is it me? Are you leading me or am I leading me? Is this my spirit or is this my soul? Is this my flesh or am I walking prophetically? Help me, God, so that I'll know, so that I don't get off course, that I don't become a wanderer, that I don't get so far away from your will for my life that is too much to get back. Help me, God. Help me now. Help me today. I'm looking beyond the hills. From which cometh my help, God. My help comes from you. I'm stretching my hands to you. I want you. I want you. I want what you want. I want to understand who I am. Forgive me of my sins. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Now help me. We're begging, we're beseeching, we're urgent. As the deer panted for the water brooks. So our soul longing after thee.
touch every person on the altar, touch every person in the pew. We're bowing our hearts down to you, God. It's got to be more than just preaching on Sundays and Wednesdays and Fridays and teaching class and anointing people with oil and baby dedications and funerals. We appreciate the grace that you've given us to do it. We thank you for desiring to use us in the perfunction, God, but it's got to be something else. Open our eyes, open our hearing, God, that we might see and hear you, that we might become entrepreneurs, that we might become promoted on our job, that we might become the elected officials, that we might become the voices in the marketplace, that we might become the millionaires and the missionaries, that we might become the evangelists and the prophets and the prophetesses, that we might become the apostles and the pastors, God, that we might become all that you want us to become, that we don't limit, God, ourselves to something locally, that we'll have global implications even right out of this place. God, you're touching the world with the anointing that's surrounding this altar. That you're bringing us out of darkness into your marvelous light. And that no person on this altar, God, will ever limit themselves again. That they'll recognize that you've got enough in heaven to take care and to do for everyone. They won't limit your ability. They won't limit your desire for their lives. That we're owners that we're landlords, that we're kings and prophets, that we're queens and mothers of communities. God, that you can use us for the great turnaround, that our bad past experiences are getting ready to be our testimony and the strength of our ministry. It's because of what you brought us out of. It's how we're gonna help somebody else get into something, into something possible and, and profitable and fruitful, God. We release ourselves to you now, and we thank you, and we bless you. In Jesus' name, shout hallelujah. Come on, you on this altar, put your hands together. Now Jesus said, now go show yourself to the priest. As you begin to walk in your newness, you show yourself to somebody, and you just slap three people and tell them, look at me now. Look at me now. How you like me now? God's doing something in my life. I've been healed. I've been changed. 